Welcome everyone. Welcome to the to the disaster shock arts and recovery reporters team reporters notebook. I'm Dr. Reggie Matthew and I welcome you to the fourth in the series of our interviews. In this episode, we'll be exploring the expressive arts use of film to target the subject of loneliness from the project on lonely signature initiative of the foundation for arts and healing. I'm first going to introduce us to our disaster shock community then provide the context for the expressive arts, and then introduce our esteemed guest. The, the Disaster Shock Global Response Team is an international humanitarian relief organization dedicated to providing psychological first aid resources to children and families affected by disaster-related stress. We are an interdisciplinary team. Our materials have been translated to over 20 languages. The Disaster Shock Global Response Team is a special interest group of the Oxford Symposium in School-Based Family Counseling, which is sponsored by the Institute for School-Based Family Counseling. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Reggie Matthew. I'm an expressive arts advocate and educator. The Disaster Shock Arts and Recovery Reporters Notebook is an interview series exploring the voices of innovative expressive arts advocates speaking to the power of the arts in healing and integrating the mind, body, spirit, and trauma recovery, and the restorative impact of community-based arts practices. Dr. Nobel, I'm first gonna provide our audience with the context of the expressive arts. The expressive arts is the practice of cultivating personal artistry as an inner resource through expressive approaches, dance, music, writing, drama, and art a tool of intermodal experiential processing for problem solving, self expansion and personal growth. What we want the audience to know is that inner artistry is not only for performance, it's not only for stage. Inner artistry is a sensibility we can bring to daily life. Intermodal processing, the capacity to move between imagery, story, movement and music is a whole brain approach offering us to engage with all parts of ourselves, a multi-sensory take, which can support our inner journey in metabolizing the complexity of our lives, reimagine new possibilities and open pathways to hope. I'm honored to introduce today our esteemed guest, Dr. Jeremy Nobel, the founder and president of Project on Lonely, an initiative of the Foundation for Arts and Healing. Dr. Nobel is on the faculty of Harvard Medical School, where his teaching and research activities address the design of healthcare delivery systems that improve quality, cost effectiveness, and access. He also works in consultation with several major organizations to develop healthcare programs that are centered on the use of emerging information technologies. A published poet, Dr. Nobel has received several awards for his poetry, including the Bain. Swigert so Prize from Princeton University and the American Academy of Poets Prize from the University of Pennsylvania. A graduate from Princeton University within the Science and Human Affairs program, he received his medical education at the University of Pennsylvania and completed his internal medicine residency at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. He is board certified in both preventative medicine and internal medicine. Dr. Nobel also holds a master's degree in epidemiology and health policy from the Harvard School of Public Health, where he is an adjunct professor. Welcome, Dr. Nobel. It's such an honor to have you here with us today. It's a pleasure to be here with you and with your audience. Dr. Nobel, as an expressive arts educator, this is my first question and advocate. A central ethos of my teaching approach is to bring ideas to life through multimedia arts expression, referred to as intermodal processing using the arts as a tool to process theme, themes. This method invites students to connect to ideas intellectually and kinesthetically, to let the ideas begin to live inside of themselves. When I stumbled upon the project Unlonely Film Festival, I discovered a cross-cultural, intergenerational, intersection collection of short films, exploring the themes of loneliness across gender, race, class, nationality, and more. 
I laughed, I cried, I reflected. Each film offered an impactful lens into the human triumphs and struggles. Can you explain to our global audience what is Project The Lonely Film Festival and how did you arrive at the expressive art of cinema and short film to tell the story and target the subject of loneliness? It'd be my pleasure. So before I talk about the film festival as part of Project on Lonely, let me give a brief overview of Project on Lonely that we started in May 2016, really in response to recognizing that loneliness was an emerging and rapidly accelerating public health crisis. So Project on Lonely was launched with three goals. The first goal was to increase awareness of loneliness and its toxicity, not just as a mental health issue, but a physical health issue. The second goal is to reduce the stigma that surrounds it so people would be willing to have conversations, explore it themselves without the, um, the reluctance that often comes with stigma. And the third goal was to actually design and deliver uh, effective programming that would allow people to be better connected. Much of that programming really harnessing you know, the power of creative expression and the arts. The Unlonely Film Festival we started about a year into the project, recognizing that loneliness as a topic was very hard for people to stare straight at sometimes. One of the powers of the arts is it allows us often to, to see and make sense of things um, by, uh, by looking at it almost as Emily Dickinson would say as a great poet, um, from a slant. So film offers that. And so we thought, wow, why don't we use this medium this powerful medium of film, which combines elements of music and visual art and theater and language arts as, as a way to invite people into narratives of loneliness. And so, you know, we make sure that these are all short films. They are of different types. We have documentaries, we have animated films, we have narrative films. And the goal is to invite people, you know, through the experience of the film, to make sense of loneliness in a different way, uh, sometimes generalize what they may be feeling as loneliness or understanding loneliness in the context how of other people um, experience it. And most importantly, to not be afraid of it, to demystify it so that there's an ability to navigate it, which ultimately is what we all have to do. Everyone experiences loneliness at some time or another. In fact, there are many people, myself included, who think it's useful to think of loneliness as a signal. Mm -hmm. And just like thirst is a signal that we need hydration, loneliness is a signal that we need social connections of a certain authenticity and quality. I don't know anyone who's ever been embarrassed about being thirsty. The mm -hmm. question is why are we embarrassed about being lonely? And that's often culturally constructed. Mm -hmm. And it's our view that we can, if it's culturally constructed, we can culturally reconstruct it. Mm -hmm. And we think that these films and the conversations people have after watching them, either on their own or together, can be powerful in going down that road. Mm -hmm. So that's how the Unlonely Film Festival anchors really one of the, the great goals of Project Unlonely, which is to become more uh, aware of loneliness, more willing to engage with it, understand it, and navigate. Yes, the human mind is a narrative mind. We've been thinking in terms of beginning, middle, and end since childhood, so that the use of the film is a powerful tool in engaging and inviting people into that dialogue. This brings me to my next question. Screenplay Robert Ripberger says that if you've seen a thousand movies, you've lived a thousand lives. The films of Project and Lonely tell stories of aging, gender, identity, immigration, sexual health rights, emerging adulthood, and more. They are stories told with bravery, transparency, and life affirmation. What's compelling to me and why this, sub this project is so close to my heart is that the, the depth, breadth, and the scope of the story storytelling. So we see stories about the loneliness of being a nomadic senior, the loneliness of being in your 20s and adulting and adjusting to a new city, the loneliness of being a new immigrant in a foreign culture, the loneliness of being an aged trans woman finding her place in the world, the loneliness of being a widower with a lifeline of losing a lifetime partner, the loneliness of being a sexual assault survivor and having to return to the office withholding the secret, 
the loneliness of being queer and not having access to inclusive spaces. This collection, the cultural and identity range, defies stigma and preconceived notions on the subject of loneliness, that at every stage of life, we are re renegotiating connection and what I would call an attached life, and that is not an easy task. So what's gripping to me is that this project really has taken a lifespan perspective on loneliness, that at every stage of life, we're contending with this challenge, this dilemma, and also this invitation to reattach. Can you say something about the commitment to the lifespan perspective? Because that is something that I found absolutely gripping about this collection. It would be a pleasure. So, so loneliness uh, walks alongside of us through the entire lifespan. And first, it might be useful to talk a little bit about what loneliness is so that you can see how integrated it is to every aspect of the lifespan. So, you know, classically, social psychologists define loneliness as the gap between totally subjective. It's the gap between the social connections we aspire to, desire, and want to have and the ones we actually experience. Unlike isolation, which is objective, the number of people you're around. So in loneliness, this gap actually, you know, can be quite painful. And so we experience that pain that often leads to a sense of, hey, we did something wrong, we're at fault and so on. And so the guilt and shame that often uh, accompanies loneliness becomes part of the challenge of navigating it because we think it's our fault. Mm -hmm. And so we deliberately kind of try to look at not only loneliness across the lifespan, but different types of loneliness. Mm. One of the things that many people who work alongside with us um, and engage with our programming find very helpful is the simple recognition that just like there are different kinds of love, there are different kinds of loneliness. Mm. There's love of country, there's erotic love, there's romantic love, love your neighbor. They're not all the same. Mm -hmm. And, and with loneliness, there are three types that we find very useful. And this comes back to your lifespan because you'll see that you navigate them in different ways at different age. The first type of loneliness is psychological loneliness. This is what most people think of. Where's my friend? Where's someone to tell my troubles to? Where's someone who's got my back? You know, most, most of the scales and measures out there that measure loneliness measure this type of loneliness. Mm -hmm. But there are two other kinds that we have to navigate also. The second one really is a societal kind of, you know, am I included or excluded? Am I in or out? The way I often talk about this is to say, imagine a room full of people and you're thinking about entering that room. Is your arrival anticipated, welcome, and safe? Mm -hmm. And if it is, you're going to have a different sense of going into that room. Mm -hmm. And many times we're forced to go into rooms, whether it's a school, a workplace, you know, down the street. And so if it's a hostile environment, you know, you're, you're, you're navigating that. And it's a very specific kind of loneliness. Mm -hmm. Taken to scale and made systemic, this is racism, mm -hmm. a systematic exclusion because, because of uh, race. Mm -hmm. But it applies to other kinds of difference also, whether it's, you know, gender, disability, new immigrant status, whatever it is, not, a, not being part of the conventional beauty narrative. Mm -hmm. So that's societal loneliness. The third type, and the one that I think in some ways may be most interesting and important to understand, you might call spiritual or existential loneliness. Mm -hmm. How am I connected to the universe? Mm -hmm. What was here before I arrived? Mm -hmm. What will be here after I depart? Mm -hmm. Does my life have meaning? Mm -hmm. Do I have consequence or am I disposable? Mm -hmm. So as we, as we share films that talk about everything from, you know, young adults trying to make sense of their social choices mm -hmm. to older adults trying to make sense of the life they just lived, mm -hmm. you can see that these three types of loneliness appear, appear in many of these films. In fact, some of the films have all three. Mm. So that's what we're trying to do is, is just bring to people the complexities of loneliness in the human experience, mm -hmm. not just across the lifespan, but the different types of loneliness, mm -hmm. so we can fully appreciate them and make sense of them in our own lives. Mm. Yes. Oh, you said some magic word for me, safety, which brings me to my next question. Uh, what I would love to educate the audience is how the 
uh, Project Unlonely uh, Film Festival is curated and constructed on the website, which is an invaluable resources, resource for educators around the country and around the world. It is a three part construction, which has meaning for me. First, there's the film and the description of the film. Then there's the story of the filmmaker. And I love in every film, it says, what is their why? And then there's guided, curated questions, thoughtful, open-ended, gentle, respectful questions about talking about the nature of what was the theme of the film, you know, ranging from racism to exclusion and all of these complex themes. I can only imagine the work that's gone into curating the questions. Can you talk about that three-part construction? Because I, um, you know, all three part components of it is something that's very important for me when I've done public health advocacy lectures in the community. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the film itself obviously presents a lot of material, some of it overwhelming, some of it mysterious. For people who don't spend a lot of time, you know, kind of trying to make sense of art in general or film in particular, we thought, you know, giving a little bit of helpful tools along the way to avoid the sense of intimidation of, oh, I don't know what's going on here. Can't be anything here for me, right? <laughs> Which I you know um, is a common feeling. And so mm -hmm. we, we do what we can to uh, provide access to the film. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the questions we offer are another way to provide access because we live in a very, um, you know, kind of performative and also comparative society. Mm, absolutely. The most common people, when they talk about, oh, I went to a film and people say, was it any good? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's an interesting question in a way, but there's so, there's so many other ways to explore a film. Like what made you curious? Mm -hmm. Was there something in that film you want to make, you want to know more about? Was there something in that film that you related to and how did that feel? Mm -hmm. So we find that these questions, as open-ended as they are, you know, you can often use similar questions for different films. Mm -hmm. Are, are, are almost uh, magical in their ability to invite people into the creative experience. So they begin to encounter um, the, what is, you know, the ideas, thoughts, and feelings that are being expressed by the filmmaker in a way that makes it very personal. Yeah, and also safe because some of the nature of the films are quite complex, but I found that the, the curated questions gently sort of presents things for people to think about related to the theme that was presented. So my next question is, in cinema therapy, it's a branch of the expressive arts that posits that stories allow us to reveal, reflect, and draw inferences about our lives with safety and aesthetic distance. As you said, this film collection includes animation shorts, docu-shorts, fiction, nonfiction, all exploring the theme of loneliness. I've used um, this these film collection in my own teaching. I've referred them to the mental health community to share with clients in their healing club recovery journey. I've shared it with um, nonprofit organizations in the community. What is your vision of how you could see, how you vision these films to be of use? You know, you know these films and, and, you know, kind of the love and care with which we curate them, array them and so on, uh, you know, really, is is a gift that we feel the filmmaker is giving <laughs> to the audience to us you know we're you know we're trying to be helpful you know along the way you know and so you know we we know that stories narratives as you say are how we make sense of the world mm -hmm. and it's amazing how how a certain film can change how you make sense of the world and making sense of the world often determines whether you're lonely or not. Yeah. Here's a simple example. Imagine yourself walking down the street and it's twilight. You know, this kind of, you're not sure, the dark is coming, there's still a light and someone is walking towards you. They're not close enough that you see their face or anything in particular, you know, it's just a person walking towards you. So your brain always on guard for threat mm -hmm. is saying, is this person an opportunity or a threat? Mm -hmm. So there's a social cognition going on. You know, is this person an, an opportunity threat is a, is a fundamental social question. And it was always interesting to me how we make that decision. Often it's based on past experiences. This is the result of trauma. And so if you've had certain experiences, your, your mind brain complex is oriented to making sense of the world in a certain way that's self-protective. You don't wanna be hurt again. Mm 
Mm. You want to be safe. You want to avoid pain. This is natural. It's healthy. Mm -hmm. But if people have had trauma, it may be that they're avoiding situations that otherwise actually could be opportunities. Mm -hmm. We think that watching certain films in some ways could rewire your social cognition so you're more receptive mm -hmm. to what could be opportunities and less um, vulnerable to um, prior pain that might guide you down behavioral pathways that aren't helpful. Mm -hmm. And so this this is part of the I think the um, the health enhancing uh, quality of not just the film but all of art, which is it actually alters how we make sense of the world. Mm -hmm. That the arts provide that safety and aesthetic distance to experience new things that not maybe part of our 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 inner world uh, to open those possibilities. Exactly right, and to do it from a safe distance. Yes. Absolutely. Because some, you know, you know, because sometimes the world can be harsh and painful. Mm -hmm. Film can remind us of that, but also show us that it isn't always as harsh and painful as we imagine it might be. Mm -hmm. And also new imaginings of a different future, of other possibilities that we may not have an emotional reference for. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And then new horizons, new pathways uh evolve for people and ultimately that can for some people allow them to be connected in ways that would reduce their loneliness mm -hmm. that's what makes the that's why we think this can be helpful to be on lonely mm -hmm. and i also want to share with the audience that these set of films are available 365 days a year they're available free of charge um there's also a film club that people can join to be part of each year's film festival is that, that's correct that is correct. We're just so delighted that we've been having the support for individual donors, sponsors to make these uh, films available. Some of them we, we acknowledge, um, you know, on the website, you know, make, making a, um, a program like this is a team sport. We're also very fortunate to have on this, the team a remarkable filmmaker himself, Mike Passernak who's been with us from the very beginning. Mike's made over 270 films. He loves making movies. Mm -hmm. When he started with us, he was president of production at Lionsgate Films. His work has always been on a volunteer basis. And in fact, you know, he's introduced us to a lot of people who love film. He's been a ter terrific supporter. He also pulls together the judging team that actually acknowledges the uh, honorable mentions and the awards. And you know, been a great partner for us uh, in bringing the aesthetics and power of the film out as a healing force. Mm -hmm. Something most commercial uh, studios don't think of as a primary activity, mm -hmm. but yet does accompany much of their work. So mm -hmm. again, it, it's a team sport. Yeah, that you have the gift of his understanding of the the cinematic language that he understands really deeply. Yes, and in fact, he's a very generous teacher. He's taught me. He's taught the staff about many things about film that, that um, you know, kind of energize and excites him. And now through that teaching energizes and excites the rest, energizes and excites the rest of us. So Jeremy, now I'd like to have a brief film discussion with you and offer our audience two films. Um, so the first film that I'd like to share with the audience uh, is a film, short film entitled Sticks and Stones by filmmakers, Cynthia White, and Alexander White. This is a film about a man, uh, a person who identifies as male, Dr. Bill J. Dolan. Bill sorts through the debris of his childhood, seeking help to untangle the differences between his own anxiety and depression and the impact of toxic masculinity. So with your permission, I'd like us to view this film together and perhaps have a brief discussion afterwards. What I'd like to alert the audiences is this is a, a short film about one person's journey of trauma and recovery. Uh, the nature and the content of the film is trauma sensitive. So we just want to alert people to that before we have the viewing. But our emphasis and focus in, is on Bill's journey of healing, which connects to our themes of the arts as a tool in the healing path. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Sticks and stones will break my bones. 
The words will never hurt me. Come on, boy. Man up. Keep up. Man up. Sit down. Shut up. Keep up. Man up. Sit down. Shut up. Keep up. Don't cry. Don't cry. Do not cry. In my class, you're finally a man. When you can kick your old man's But my moment never came. So soaked in my old man's Avon cologne and self-loathing, I resist the shame of not belonging. My stepfather had the darkest, meanest eyes I'd ever seen. Years of alcoholic rage focused into two one and a half inch spaces under thick black eyebrows. Those eyes haunted me for years, alerting me to what was coming like a dog that feels a kick before the kick lands. I was a freshman in college when I heard he'd been killed. My stepfather's death was swift and violent the heart in a bar. I couldn't help but wonder, is this the path I'm on? Will this be my fate? Man, Man up. Sit, sit down, down. Chin, chin up. up. Shut up. Suck Shut it up. up. Drink Suck up. Suck it up. Just lie. Drink up. Just lie. Don't cry. Some part of me knew this man up stuff was bull, but it was everywhere, and it followed me deep into my adult life. Admitting my struggles with anxiety and depression would have made me vulnerable. Vulnerability meant weakness. I think that's why it took me so long to recognize the mental illness I lived with even as a child. I needed to draw my feelings because I didn't have words for them. Man up. Man up. Man up. Sit down. Chin up. Or shut up. It took years for me to recognize that I had an anxiety disorder, which explained why I spent most of my life in fight or flight mode. I was finally able to acknowledge that I needed help. Uh, hello? I realized I'd been on a path to a type of masculinity that I didn't want to live by. Drawing helped me identify what I was struggling with. It's wonderfully freeing to speak your truth. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Dolan and filmmakers Cynthia White and Alexander White for that beautiful offering. Um, it's a difficult short film to watch and I want to speak to some of the themes that I feel would be connected to what we're discussing today. Um, Dr. Dolan said in this film that it took years for him to recognize that he needed help and that he saw vulnerability as weakness. And um, I'm thinking of Senator John Fetterman, who recently had the brave, took the brave, courageous step, it was a gift to our country, to publicly and transparently acknowledge that he was suffering from depression and agreed to a hospitalization. That sometimes human experience defies words. And this person, Dr. Jolin, through art, found a way to metabolize almost the unmetabolizable. So I just wanted to know your thoughts about this piece of work. Well, I think this is a beautiful film. And it has so many elements in it that I think demonstrate the power of art. You know, obviously, you know, it's a difficult, painful subject for the art maker here. And yet, you know, it communicates it um, with incredible beauty. Mm -hmm. You know, the actual animation and the color washes in the background and so, so on 
are just breathtakingly beautiful, but doesn't sugarcoat it, right? You know, when, when the father-in-law turns, you know, and you see the eyes as described, you know, it's horrific, it's horrifying. You can feel the, 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 the fear, the terror, you know, and yet at the same time, <laughs> It, there's there's even humor in it, you know, like when when in in the, the therapy scene where he's talking, it's a crow dressed up as a therapist. Mm -hmm. So this is what the arts allow you to do, you know. I mean, it's a crow doing being a therapist. So this came right out of you know the filmmaker's imagination, you know. So the crow was the kind of you know the innocent bystander victim, right, of his father's hunting. That's in the early scenes. You know, the, the, you know, the young child is with the father, witnesses this, the feather drops on the child. You know, he's a participant in, in the trauma, unwilling, unwitting, but still a participant. And so the film is able to take the complexity of all those emotions and, and offer it to us, you know, as a narrative, as a story. Now, this one actually has a very declarative ending, you know, that beautiful, you know, kind of testimonial at the end that the truth will set you free you know, and you feel freed, you know, as the viewer of this. So, so what happens to me when I watch a film is this interesting tension between the particularity of the film, you know, so he's talking about his um, coming out about his childhood trauma and so on and his father and how freeing that is, you know, um, but the power of the arts often is in the universal relation, the, the universality of the story. So yes, he had a particular story, um, but I don't think there are many people watching this film who don't relate in some way to some aspect of it. You know, the sense of being held hostage through your own fear to a kind of anxiety, that anxiety then shapes, as I said, your social cognition. You hold back, you feel it's your fault, as he expressed, you know, there was something, you know, broken with him. He, was, he felt ashamed of being anxious. And yet it's still, you're able to work it through. And, you know, my, my sense is he's had a lot of support along the way. And in this, in this wonderful way, this film also gives back to other people. Mm -hmm. What I also appreciated about this film is in the description of the filmmaker say, what, what is your why? Uh, the filmmaker described meeting um, Bill and that it was first like a one man show and then they transferred it to what we'd say in the expressive arts intermodal transfer to animation, then to imagery, then to drawing. So this particular person drew upon many art forms to process his way through this complex story. Yeah. So I think that that's important too, that, you know, we, it's, it's it, the first form is a beginning, it's not an ending. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, you know, this multimodality mm -hmm. of expression, you know, as, as more brain science emerges and we see that, you know, kind of visual art activates the brain in a specific way, language art in another way, movement, the functioning of mirror neurons to actually allow you feel feel participatory mm -hmm. in the expressiveness of others. This is all fantastic work mm -hmm. and probably synergistic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in a film like this that incorporates multiple uh, creative elements, multiple creative modalities, as you say, I think it becomes even more powerful. Absolutely. So, um, Jeremy, this brings me to your offering. You offered a poem to our audience. And I know uh, from studying your work that poetry has been an ally throughout your life. Um, so can you share uh, the story of that poem and also the role that poetry has played in your own journey? Sure, I, I would. This is a poem I actually uh, wrote pretty early in my poetic journey. I mean, I started writing po poetry when I was, I was actually a young, fairly young teenager. It was kind of, I grew up in Pittsburgh and just kind of, you know, and I had a wonderful, loving family, but I did lose my father when I was 15. He died of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of disruption in the family and a lot to make sense of. And somehow words on the page um, were helpful. And I, I was fortunate to be able to continue studying poetry in college and so on. And, but, and then, you know, in my medical training, it was really helpful to make sense of things because things were coming at me pretty fast. And, um, uh, and this particular poem I actually wrote as a, I think as a fourth year medical student. And, and it, and it just gave me a way to make sense of the uh, intimacy of the experience I was having with complete strangers, mm -hmm. you know, 
obviously people experience the poem and, and get their own sense of it. But I think for me, uh, both as a writer of poems, but also as a reader of poems, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the intimacy that language, poetic language offers as compared to literal language, which I also enjoy, mm -hmm. um, somehow can kind of seep into the corners of your experience. Mm -hmm you know, with, with, with a very um, powerful impact. And mm -hmm. again, change how you make sense of the world, mm -hmm. change how you make sense of your opportunities. And, and with that, it changes not only your attitudes, but your behaviors, which can then take you to places that are more healthy. Uh, and I think poetry has often done that for me. Mm -hmm. I've had many uh, people say that various forms like poetry helps reconstruct things internally, reimagine them, and especially with the art form of poetry, which lends itself to metaphor, to reconfigure the moment with a different framework. Yeah, a very famous American uh, poet, William Carlos Williams, was also a physician. I actually went to the University of Pennsylvania, and, uh, and that's where Dr. Williams went. And I did win a poetry award there when I was a medical student, or a medical student, and Dr. Williams' grandson came. <laughs> to the award ceremony, which is great. He was not a poet, but he uh, also was a physician. He also went to the University of Pennsylvania. So Dr. Williams has a wonderful quote. It's in um, a poem called Asphodel, the Greeny Flower, where he says, it's a tough way to get the news, poetry, but people die every day for lack of what's found there. Thank you for that offering. Now I'd like to move to our second film. Miss Diva Trucker. Filmmaker is Dana Riley. Miss Diva Trucker, aka Tamara Brock, is a long haul trucker who turns to YouTube to combat loneliness and social isolation in the process of creating an empowering online community whose impact reaches far beyond America's highways. So I'd like to take a moment again, uh, Jeremy, and watch this second film offering that we're sharing with the audience. very hard on the road trying to get a hair appointment or stop by the beauty salon because there's not too many places you can pull an 18 wheeler up. You have to learn how to do what you can yourself. Good morning, good morning, fam. It's your girl, Miss Diva Trucker, and I'm coming to you today. Hello, 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 superstars. Happy Sunday to you. I'm just coming to you today to give you a little bit of words of motivation. Ask yourself today, are you doing what you are meant to be doing in your life? Peace, love, joy, and happiness, and y'all have a wonderful and blessed day. Bye. Other people may do 
do it differently, this is how it works for me. The only time that I use the high and low gear is uh, when I'm going up and down the uh, hills. Or the when mountains. I first started on YouTube and came out here, people was like, oh my goodness, we didn't even realize it was women out here that drove trucks like that. Good morning, Mr. Brock. I mean, good night. Oh, did I wake you up? Apparently, I stopped driving three three hours ago. Oh, so I did wake you up. You were asleep. Yeah, I answered the phone for you. Oh, whatever. Then, well, I'll let you go back to sleep. security detail. You're supposed to be at the door watching, making sure ain't nobody coming in here. You, I can't be sleeping. You sleep. Talk to y'all later, child. Bye. This is a cold industry. You could die out here and nobody would. Some, some of these drivers don't even have enough money that if they died, they couldn't even afford to get shipped home. What that affected me the most was a female driver found dead in New Orleans in, a tr in her truck. Nobody checked on her for like three days. And they still don't know what happened to her. And it's like, that could be me, you know? I'm out here on this road every every day. I travel up and down this road at night, going to truck stops, going to rest, day, rest areas. 
And to have a child 23, 24 years old and can't nobody tell you what happened to your daughter, your son, or whatever the case may be, no. nine years of being married I'm not going to be married anymore that I got to get a divorce and I tried everything that I could do everything that I could do. I did what I was supposed to do. I felt like I did what I was supposed to do. I came out here. I worked hard. I bust my butt. I'm paying for this truck. I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do. We came from, we came from nothing. When I tell you that we came from nothing, we came from nothing. It is what it is, y'all. It is what it is. You know what? No relationship is perfect. No relationship is this. No relationship is that. You're right. But I'd be darned if I go through another year. If I go, if you can't speak to me with kindness, if you can't speak to me with love in your heart, if you can't look out for me, It is what it is. That's what's going on with me. That's what I'm dealing with. So, you know, this too will pass. I just, I have to get, I have to get it out. Cause if you don't get it out, it eats at you. It eats at you. And then you dwell on it and you, it's like, I, and I got stuff to do. I can't worry about that. I can't, I got to just get it off my chest and get it out there and just move on and not worry about it and continue to focus on what it is I came in this industry to do. And I've gone too far to give up now.
that is one of my most favorite films. It's that film is close to my heart. I I, I just love the story of this Tamara Brock, Miss Diva Trucker. Um, this film, what I first love about it is the challenges of building community. This is someone who's working the night shift. Uh, community and connection is not accessible. Uh, there are barriers and across the lifespan, the barriers to creating community are real. Uh, but Ms. Trucker found a creative path to building community and the community she found through her YouTube channel is so touching and so moving. Uh, so I love this film as, uh, you know, as a model for thinking creatively of how we connect and what's accessible to us this film. Yeah, I love this film too. It's so honest and it's, and, and, um, and she's willing to share both her sense of, you know, pain and loss, but also her victory, her pride, you know, of having come from what she describes as less than nothing to, she has, she has a community out there and, you know, kind of ends with that strong sense. She, you know, she knows they're out there and, you know, in her own, you know, uh, frustration, with her relationship and so on she said okay well you have relationships and you have relationships but but she also has community and she found it and you know just the the details of her personality come through so so clearly you know and and in uh in in a very endearing way yeah you can't help but fall in love with miss trucker you know can't just, help. just the courage she had I, I as i was watching i was like wow what a gift that she's letting us in and telling us this story and how and we know that there's a supply chain crisis in the US there are many people working odd shifts odd mm -hmm. hours uh, working very difficult and long hours where it makes it difficult for them to find community and feel connected so I just felt her story was such a gift and such a contribution yes another example where there's a very particular story but it relates to the universal human experience of we're all driving our own truck but we also need a community Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Jeremy, so this brings me to the next question about the community of Disaster Shock. The Disaster Shock community is a psychological first aid organization providing resources to affected areas around the world. The world is becoming increasingly complex. Communities are, been, are being affected by natural disasters, gun violence, family who've lost loved ones to the pandemic, and the growing community of long COVID, long haul COVID survivors. There will be many communities in need in the coming decade, and we know that recovery and rehabilitation of a community can take a decade or more. One of our former interviewees, Ping Ho, who I believe you know, talked in detail with us about the arts serving as a public health safety net. And I know that part of your work was also inspired by 9-11 and what you witnessed afterwards. So I just thought that, that that story would be a helpful example to people that are inspired or compelled to serve these communities and needs. Can you talk a little bit about the origins of what prompted this journey for you? Yeah, you mentioned 9-11. Um, <laughs> I just have to, you know, as a poet, I'm seeing relationships between things all the time. You, you mentioned long haul COVID. We just watched, you know, a film on long haul trucking. And I'm thinking, this is what chronic illness is. It's a long haul truck drive, truck ride, and you're the driver. Mm. And you, and like, one of the things I like most about the art and as an art maker is it reminds you, you have choices. Mm -hmm. So as a poet, it's this word or that word, line break here or not, rhyme, not rhyme, you know, structured poem like a sonic free verse, right? It's all choices. So when you make art of any kind, mm -hmm. it reminds you, you have choices, just like Diva Trucker <laughs> had choices. So my interest in, in the arts and healing actually did come directly out of 9-11. I went through that experience. It, it really, you know, kind of guided me into some personal self-examination. <laughs> you know, what's going on with Jeremy? You know, what matters? What's going on in his life? And it, and it took me back in many ways to poetry. Um, and I started writing. Again, it kind of reignited my love for that art form. But then one, one day, it was summer of 2000 and, um, 2002, I think it was, or three, not much longer. The Museum of New York had an exhibit of um, art done by kids in the five boroughs in response to 9-11. Mm -hmm. 
this this art was done purposefully with you know child life specialists and and art therapists for kids who were experiencing acute trauma mm. and they had a classic triad of symptoms of acute trauma response they had difficulty sleeping at night emotional ability uh, and difficulty concentrating and doing just simple draw what's on your mind exercises which they did drawing horrific images, planes going into buildings, people on fire falling out of the buildings. But the kids got better and they got better across race and class, which signaled pretty strongly that something was going on in the brain. Mm -hmm. When you invite people to make sense of the world, use creativity, imagination, you know, take, you know, process their recollections, their thoughts and feelings into artistic, creative, aesthetic artifacts. I said, this is so, fantastically interesting, you know, we need to explore it more. And so for a number of reasons, it felt a little complicated to integrate that new line of curious thinking into my traditional ac academic work, which at the time was around healthcare quality improvement and so on. And so I said, oh, I'm gonna start a nonprofit foundation. How hard could that be? Well, <laughs> as anyone in the nonprofit world knows, it's, uh, it's quite challenging. We got going. Um, got started in 2004, um, and our first focus was on trauma relief. Mm -hmm. And so I think the power of, of the arts um, to do some of the work you're focused on is incredible. Mm -hmm. We've done it, you know, we mobilized some art therapists in response to Hurricane Sandy mm -hmm. and homelessness and, and helped staff a homeless shelter in Queens College. Shortly after Hurricane Sandy, we raised an anonymous donor stepped up $5,000 of art supplies. We had 14 art therapists volunteer. We staffed it for six weeks. Mm -hmm. So these things are possible, but they can also be done in a more coordinated international scale. So I have tremendous respect for what, what you're trying to achieve here. Mm -hmm. I know that your thinking has evolved and it's culminated in an upcoming book, Project and Lonely, Healing Our Crisis of Disconnection. Uh, some of your thinking is outlined on the website in terms of the national initiative um, and some of the values and aims, but I would love to hear how your thinking has evolved into culminating into this upcoming book. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And, you know, the book, you know, will be released uh, by Penguin Random House um, on October 3rd, but it's, you know, it's up and available to learn more about it, pre-order it if you like. Um, the most important thing to know about this book, um, it, it's called Project on Lonely, Healing Our Crisis of Disconnection. It's, it does talk about our work at the foundation. I draw on that. It talks a little bit about experiences I've had about loneliness in my life, although it's not a memoir. But it's really an invitation mm. to design your own project on lonely. Mm. Because we all can. A little bit like Ms. Diva Trucker designed her life. We make choices. And I hope the book is illuminating to people, demystifying loneliness, providing a little bit of guidance, a little bit like I did in this wonderful podcast, the types of loneliness and so on, but goes a little bit further, suggests some ways that you might want to think about organizing some experiences for yourself, although it's not a self-help book, it's just basic principles. And it also calls on some key institutions to do their part. Healthcare is an institution employers, especially large ones, to foster a, a sense of connection and belonging. And not for just humanitarian reasons, it's good business. Mm -hmm. People bring their best selves to work, their best performance, creative ideas, ability to collaborate. This is what makes businesses thrive. I know the last institution, just really quickly, is higher education. Mm -hmm. It's important to recognize that the 18 to 24 year old demographic, as far as we could tell, is the loneliest demographic mm -hmm. in the US right now. Higher education institutions have an enormous opportunity, and I would say obligation as part of the educational commitment to address loneliness, to enable learning, to enable self-knowledge, self-awareness, and really deliver to, to students an orientation and foundational to, of lifetime learning that'll take them through uh, all the lifespan. I heard you say in your lectures, which I really appreciate, is bringing the issue of loneliness and also creative practice as a clinical indicator in evaluations when doctors are meeting with patients to ask, mm -hmm. do you have a creative practice? 
and to bring in the subject of loneliness as a clinical indicator on a person to person level, in addition to creating social spaces where people can encounter each other through the arts. Yeah, so this is tremendously timely right now. You know, so I, I was trained as a healthcare practitioner and in the traditional medical training, you're trained to detect, diagnose and treat illness. This is a fantastic thing. It's really important, but health is more than the absence of illness. Mm -hmm. The World Health Organization defines it as the full achievement of physical, mental, and social potential. Mm -hmm. So how do we expand our definition of health using healthcare really as a, as a jumping off point to invite people to think about ways they could thrive and flourish in better connection with themselves and others? doesn't mean the physician has to do it. The care team is often includes health educators, others, other clinicians who can assist. But the other really interesting opportunity is they then recognize and educate and coach within the care delivery system. But then they guide people into community experiences that can be in libraries, museums, schools, to give people an opportunity to encounter themselves through creative expression and through doing that to encounter others. Mm -hmm. So I think this, this actually will become increasingly common in the, in the next few years. It's been in the UK for about 10 years and there are many forces moving it in this direction. Mm -hmm. So bringing it into the public and clinical lexicon and shifting the paradigm of integrating it. I love what you said about potential health and well-being. Yeah, and by the way, one of the real challenges in healthcare right now is a burnt out and exhausted healthcare workforce. There are many reasons for this. The last three years have not been easy ones for those on the front lines of healthcare. Often they've lost loved ones or they've dealt with the frustration of seeing patient after patient uh, not survive uh, through COVID mm -hmm. in, being, in doing cross coverage and often pulled into clinical scenarios where they don't feel fully capable or trained. You know, so nurses in the cardiac cath lab being pulled into the emergency room, right? Because that's where they had to go. And they, they went to, to do their duty, but not without consequences. Mm -hmm. So this increased focus on the importance of, of loneliness and its opposite in a way, connection, mm -hmm. will be as life enhancing, quality enhancing for those who deliver healthcare as those who depend on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that social and relational medicine is the foundation of the psych psyche and psychological development over the lifespan and the importance of the attached life. And you're really seeking to shift that paradigm. Jeremy, Project on Lonely is not only a case study in loneliness across the lifespan, but it's also the model of the future of inclusive storytelling. It is a gift to the world. Project on Lonely understands deeply that the true path of easing our loneliness is through social empathy. When we find our shared humanity in the stories of each other, what is the legacy of Project on Lonely? Well, it's so, it's so kind of you to say that in such a, a gracious way. I think our legacy, what I hope Project on Lonely does, is reminds us that we all can have our own Project on Lonely that we can treat loneliness as a signal, just like thirst, that we can get past the guilt and shame or you know, responsibility or the sense that it's our fault, be better connected to self, to others, to the community, and we'll all benefit. That is what I hope the legacy will be. So Jeremy, um, at, uh, we wanna to note to the audience that at the end of this interview, we do have a detailed PowerPoint which will educate our audience about Project Lone Lonely and the Foundation for Arts and Healing, and that there are many ways to engage with your foundation. Is that correct? Absolutely. Come watch the film, sign up for our film newsletter. We won't pester you. I think we're down to every other week. And each, each film newsletter comes with a link to a specific film, a little bit of background on it, so you can kind of watch it at your leisure. And the other reminder is, if you enjoy a film, watch it with others. As fantastic as it, as it is to watch one of these films on your own, to watch it in a group or with others, even if you do it independently, but then talk about it, seems to bring out a different kind of magic uh, that, that connects people. And again, to themselves, to, to each other, and in some very important ways in these challenging times to a happier future. 
Now the book is going to be launched in April formally, if I'm correct, and then the seventh annual Unlonely Film Festival will be afterwards. Is that correct? What what happens in in April is what I'm called, you know, kind of the pre-launch, you know, kind of visibility activity, and that includes a pre-order page. We'll be talking about it. Uh, the book itself becomes available on October third. Well, thank you for your time, Jeremy. It was an honor to be with you, and I wish you unfailing endurance for this vital, timeless arts advocacy mission. Thanks, and it's a pleasure to be here with you and with the community you're so dedicated to serving. It's, it's really my honor. Mm -hmm.